Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Cushman and Wakefield, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, New York Community Bank, Bank of America, Kilroy Metal Products, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Essex Capital Partners, Excel Realty Advisors, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, G.V.A. Williams, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Helmsley Spear, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, John Katsimatidis, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Madison Realty Capital, Marcus and Millichap, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, the Moynian Group. Hello, my name is Michael Stoller. New York City, in this terrible, terrible credit crisis, in a terrible economy, what's happening with the office market? I have assembled today a distinguished group of individuals. I don't know what they do for a living anymore, but they are allegedly heads of leasing uh, brokerage firms who are going to tell me and my audience what's happening with New York City and the tri-state region. My guests today include Peter Rigardi, president of the New York region of Jones Lang LaSalle, David Arena, president of the New York region of Grubb and Ellis, Robert Friedman, executive vice chairman of First Service Williams, and last but not least, Mitch Konsker, uh, vice chairman of Cushman and Wakefield. Since you're last but not least, what's really going on, Konsker? You and I go back many years, come on. <laughs> Um, first of all, there is a lot of activity in the market today. Um, unfortunately, you it's, lying again? No. Unfortunately, <laughs> that's the conversion of that activity into deals. So there's a lot of target kickers in the market looking at space, and the problem that the brokers, both on tenant and landlord side, is having is making deals. We don't know where the bottom is. We don't know. Um, you have many uh, landlords trying to reach for renewals, short-term renewals. So representing on the landlord side, the vacancy, you potentially have a, potentially you have difficulty trying to convert those into transactions. You know, we were talking prior to the show, y your office is in Black Rock, okay, 51 West 52nd Street. CBS Tower, great building, everybody well known, of course, street from the New York Hilton, you know, it's, it's a great location, China Inn. A and Peter was saying that Today, because you're moving to 1290, you yes. know, uh, next year you will have a new cubicle, no more big offices. Uh, everybody's going to have a, a little 36 strange, square foot 36 footprint. square feet. That's <laughs> it. <laughs> Peter, well, I think that's a little too much. Okay, <laughs> I know. Uh, no, they're going to have it, you know, uh, hoteling. That's what, uh, you know, he learned from the days in corporate. <laughs> okay, right. so what's going to, what could you get that great building for? We were talking, how much could a rent in that building? 51 West well, 52nd Street. You know, that's what Mitch is saying. It's very difficult for a tenant and a landlord to figure out what the right rent is. You know, uh, typically brokers and landlords and tenants look at comps, you know, previous transactions as a reference point of, you know, where their transactions should be. Wasn't that like the Bible in the, in, in the beginning? There aren't comps. There, are, there certainly aren't comps today that make sense or are justifiable because the market is definitely adjusting almost at the same rate that it grew a couple of years ago on a monthly basis, really making an adjustment. So all the money you guys made when the, the upside. <laughs> now, what's going to happen on the downside? Arena, come on. <laughs> well, these, these three made all the money. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen to the money. But, uh, you know, I would take it maybe from a little different perspective. I would say, uh, where, where's the demand gone? 
right? What what, what are tenants thinking? And I think it goes back. You to You said yeah. you have you need office space. Yeah. And you need office sure. space. You. You even signed the short-term lease yes. because you think that the market prices are going down. You would have signed the long-term lease if you thought you got the best price. Do you believe office prices are going down? I think the entire 2009 will be a, a downward adjustment in pricing. And the second reason we made that decision is we think there'll be more choices. Not only will we be able to get good pricing, but we also are going to look for choices that better meet our business objectives. It gives us uh, identity, flexibility, uh, our good location for our employee base. Couldn't, I mean, I, I remember going past Cushman. You still have an office down there. Does anyone ever have an office in the ground floor? There's a sign that says Cushman and Wade. We have, we have offices. No, no, there, there are people there. He's in the window. I mean, I mean, <laughs> exactly. He's in the window. Wait, like the toasters you give away. I mean, that's a great identity. Wouldn't you like that? The Jones Lang LaSalle building? Well, little of a tree with Comsker in I, there, I, you know. <laughs> I, I, wouldn't, I, don't, I don't know if there's a, uh, a Yiddish word or a Chinese expression, but I don't think we want to go into our biggest competitor's space. So we probably would pick another location. Wait a second, we have another competitor. <laughs> no, we have a competitor and friend who trained you at the beginning. You can go into one of his buildings. That's right. It should be noted. Who did okay. you work for initially? Well, I, I, look, I'm happy to say it. I'm proud of it. That, like, 25 <laughs> years ago, I'm I was proud of one of too. Bob's yeah. uh, camp. People, so yeah, you know, Bob and I so, go back so a long time. What, Bob, what's rents? I mean, look, people come up to me. I, I, I work with some great young guys in the office. They, they need 8,000 square feet. They need eight to 10,000. They have no idea about loss factors. They don't know what's going on with this. They, they have a friend at Cushman. Right. They have a friend at CB. You know, it's like, the, and they have no idea. What, what, what's rents? First of all, if you're looking for a pat answer, none of us are going to give it to you. And the reason is, frankly, this is a very inefficient marketplace because you don't have the velocity of trading. I think Peter said it. You look at comps. It, when you don't have the velocity of trading, you have such a thin flow to tenancy. In effect, we have a very inefficient market, so it's very difficult to gauge. Yeah. Okay, that's important but, but, to so, note. Uh, and you also have subleases that are overhanging the market. Ah. They're a wasting asset, and that's where you have the greatest I, I, degree of volatility I, in the I market. Think, I think what, what Bob's bringing out is very important because, you know, as you were saying, there's a direct leasing where you can go directly to the landlord, and there's a lot of sublease sure. space. I think somebody said, and maybe you, Mitch, you brought it up, you know, that the UBS space on, on Park Avenue made the sublease space made a mark. You could buy it. You were able to get it f for the low 60s. I think that's I mean, the answer to your question when you asked before where are rents. Rents are the cheapest alternative in the neighborhood. That's my uh, perspective. And so as long as there are sublet that are out there that are priced below what we think the market might be, those are going to have to clear the market. And I think that makes the market for it. I want to say one thing. Yeah. The sublease market, the biggest problem you're having is tenants committing today um, for sublease because they don't know the financial viability of that sublease. So all those subleases are still talking directly to the landlord. Absolutely. Because right. I think that's a very important and, thing. And also, you know, in a marketplace where, uh, you know, obviously it's a tenant's market, a lot of subleases have, have abbreviated terms. And tenants today are going to step up, are going to say, hey, you know, I'd like to have a, a long-term lease. You know, Michael, look, you, you talk about pricing. Citibank stock or Bank of America stock at 3 or $5, why wouldn't you go out and buy a lot of it right now? Or why wouldn't I buy a lot Because I was of it? stupid enough to buy it at 7.5. Then when it went down, I, 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 I was but so they, happy when it came back to 7.5. Yeah. But exactly. And, and I think the real estate market's no different. People see these prices. They look good. They're definitely a lot better than they were a couple of years ago, but they don't want to be saying, ah, I should have waited six months. I agree, year. but let's take a tenant who has six months on their lease and they need space. You know, each one of you, I mean, most of you represent uh, tenants as opposed to representing landlords. Okay? Uh, no, I yeah. we represent we both. We represent, represent, represent both. both. I think everyone represents both. Right, you represent both. Okay, I apologize because I was thinking the other side. But what happens, someone says to you, this is, you know, this is a true situation. Somebody says, I, I got six months left on my sublease because one of these guys may have been in a sublease or the lease is up. And they said, I need, let's say, eight, 9,000 square feet. I'm not sure. I don't need class A space I need a B plus space I could use space it could be on Park Avenue it could be on Park Avenue below 42nd Street it could be on Lexington Avenue it could be on 3rd Avenue it can be on 5th Avenue but I want a good deal I, you know because I'm not 
a major company, but there's no credit tenants, as we just said before. Who knows? So what should somebody, you know, they, they come to people, you're more experienced. I mean, he has more experience than all of you. He's been in here longer than you. He trained you, as he said. Okay, so. <laughs> I'm aged what, and infirm. Aged, but vibrant, yeah. vibrant. Vibrant. So what, okay. okay. So, oh, oh, so, oh, great sage. Yeah. Oh, great sage. <laughs> How much? I want to know. I got this situation. What should I pay? What, what, what should I believe? This sounds like a low-cost provider tenant. I mean, you're, you're talking about they, they could probably write a, a sublease deal, you know, three, four, five years remaining on the term. They've written it down. You know, the sublessor has written it down. 45? Deal 40, 40, 40, 45? Sure. Maybe yes. less. And, and by the way, what's interesting is, just like when tenants used to lease space, at $150 per square foot. And Peter said, that's not a consensus tenant. These are tenants who can write a $150 deal and rent is an inelastic commodity. They could pay $250 a foot. It's not relevant. But there's a psychology to the market, so it establishes the upper limit of value. So then when you write a $100 per square foot deal for a 75,000 square foot tenant, the value computes. But when you now have subleases that are overhanging a market, I mean, for example, you, you, you want to know an example of a sublease that is uh, destructive to a market? The UBS sublease, $60 per square foot, ask, 299 Park Avenue, eighth through 10th floors. So, in effect, it's psychologically damaging to our it, market. It's like going okay. into Bloomingdale's, <clears throat> and you know that you, if you paid retail, it's a Shanda. Okay, for our Gentiles, we have to say. I was a Turnbull and Asser. I was a Turnbull and Asser on Saturday. We could have brought out the store. For David Arena and myself, we need an expert. After all the years of working in the Jewish real estate market, I have to teach you. No, you don't. Peter, I have a big problem. Peter knows more Yiddish than I do. Okay, let's. All of a sudden, I only grew up with Italians. I even knew a wasp by a grape. Okay, but a different case. Okay, so. You said you went to Turnberry. No, but... Uh, Not Turnberry. Turnbull and Asser. Tur okay. Turnberry's a resort. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, there is Turnberry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I went tur Turnbull and Asser. Everything was on sale. You know, Sea Island Cotton, 400 bucks, $150. I mean, it, literally, it So was... that's the point. The point is people are saying everything's on sale in New York City today. And... I think the big question, because there are tenants who need space, you know, I mean, Jones Lang is a good example. Mm -hmm. you, you're not certain where you're going to go. You know, Grubbin Ellis has the same situation. Mm -hmm. uh, Cushman and Wakefield bought the, built the, bought the barrel last year. They're going into a great space with 1290, Bornado, great landlord. Plus, you're taking over the management, so it's a, it's a good deal in this situation. Okay, you know, taking so, over the, the, the leasing, not the Right, the leasing, leasing. leasing on this situation. So, so where, you know, where's the best market? I mean, Where's the best deal for somebody? Is it is it is it Midtown South? Is it Lower Manhattan? I think it really all depends on what you do. Right. I think it right. depends on uh, exclusively so, on what you do. So how Where's about the you move? How about, how about you moving to Lower Manhattan? We looked at it. Yeah. So why didn't you move? Just a little too far from Grand Central. Ah, at least you're no, honest. Right. I, I think that that's only one consideration. Your workforce is a major consideration. Right. I think your clients are a consideration. Where you do business is a consideration. But if you were looking for price. You'd find a a quality building, and you'd look for the sublease first, and then you'd look for the direct lease. See, I, I think that um, the decision makers at medium-sized firms, small firms, large firms have a lot in common. They're concerned about their employee base today and where they're going to get it in the future. They're concerned about the competitiveness of their business, you know, how, how and what they have to deal with. That's why New York's a great uh, solution. And I, I think, you know, what I would be telling a tenant like that, or the, your example, is you, you tell me what you want, and we have no problem getting it for you in this marketplace. So if, right. if you want to pay $30 or 35 or $40 a foot, if you want to have growth, you want to have contraction rights, you want to have some uh, overtime air conditioning privileges, whatever you want, you tell me, and in this marketplace, we can find I want to add one okay. thing to it, Michael. It's location, location, location. Because it does, there are pockets for a tenant in every area of the city where you can get a great deal. So it's not necessarily is there one great deal out there. It's really where the tenant wants to be. I agree with Peter on what his thoughts are. But you can negotiate between three or four buildings the best deal in that area. So here is a big question. What's the difference between the bid and the ask? 
You know, it's it's yeah. like when it's like when you bought stocks on, on certain markets before. You know, there was always saying they want seventy five. What can I really offer that they're not going to be offended? I think what you said before the show was you can offer anything. Somebody just may not like that what you offered. But what do you really think? Because you were saying maybe you or maybe Bob said it's it's really like you can get as much as thirty five to forty percent off the bid or ask. In this market today, I see 20 to 25 percent. Will it go to 30 percent? I believe it will go to 30. But right t today, with deals that are getting done are anywhere between 20 to 25 percent. Bob? Uh, I, would, I would tend to 20 agree. 20 to 25 percent. But one other issue, remember, right before the capital markets meltdown, I remember when we were pricing space, it was, it was illusory. We were up pricing all that merchandise. Correct. Uh, pre-capital markets meltdown. So I think you have an artificially inflated rental, asking rental structure. I think that's a very valuable Which I think point. is very and critical I, I, I agree in, and I in think this. I, I agree with, yeah. with, with Mitch, but in certain markets, I think it's even going to be more. I, I think we started, to, and, I, and, I, and I learned this business, you know, from my dad and some guys like Bob, and we had a lot of business in those early 80s in Midtown South. We were so pleased to get $20 per square foot on some of those right. buildings. And, you know, you started to see asking rents in the mid-70s for 23rd Street and places like this. And I think, you know, a lot of those asking rents haven't adjusted, and I think you could see a 50% bid and ask in locations like that. Now, now, if I remember, you live in New Jersey, correct? Yes, I do. You live in Connecticut. Connecticut. You're New York City. New York City. Okay. Uh, this question is posed to the two of you, even because, first of all, you both handle <laughs> the region. Right. Okay. How bad is the office market in New Jersey? Well, you know, the office market in New Jersey is obviously connected deeply to what happens in, in Manhattan, particularly on the waterfront, in, you know, the New Jersey waterfront, Hoboken, Jersey City. You know, the internal market, you know, is, is always subject. It's the tough part of the New Jersey market is... But let's break New Jersey into two markets. Mm -hmm. The Jersey waterfront is the best market. Rumson, South Jersey... <laughs> It's dead, isn't it? Well, I mean, the, the suburban New Jersey office market, I've had the owners on the show saying they've given it less rights in many times. Well, they, they don't lease space over there. You know, mm -hmm. they just, they hope that somebody, the brokers only make money there. You know, the pharmaceutical industry is, is a big part of the New Jersey marketplace, and there are other industry there. And, and, you know, with the population, what it is in the New Jersey area now, I, I do think there are some great labor opportunities there. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't it's write tough. it off. But it, it's challenging. But I wouldn't write it off. Westchester and Connecticut. Well, I yes, think those two markets uh, have some similarities to the Jersey waterfront in terms of their dynamics, right? And, they, and the Westchester market's been the same kind of effective rents for 20 years. 25 years, 30 20, years. For 25 years. Not even effective. The same asking same, rents. The same asking rents. You know, to me, it's about a price, right? It's even the, even the, the uh, product that you're talking about in Jersey, in the worst parts of Jersey, or in the worst parts of Connecticut, if the price is right, we'll be able to find tenants who'll take that. Now, now, now for, the, for the people who work and live in New York, there's boroughs, you know, something called the, the borough of Brooklyn, yes. you know, which S.L. Green made a commitment, bought a building at 16 Court Street last year, you know, Ratner owns a lot of property over there. What's your thoughts about Brooklyn, guys? Well, we're, we're, we're handling a big project for J.P. Morgan Chase in Metrotech, we have uh, a million square feet of space that we've just recently put on the market. And actually, we're very pleased with the amount of activity showings, uh, you know, non-for-profits, companies with different margins. What kind of rents? And government entities. What kind of rents? Uh, Mid-20s starts. Mid-20s, because a non-profit really can't get the REAP benefits. Right. Okay, Correct. So they, which really puts it down by $12 a square right. foot, 12 right. to $13 we a foot. We have a project in... Uh, uh, the Bronx on Fordham Road, and we're getting mid 30s to high 30s rents, and it's the same SIQC codes. It's health care, it's uh, education, and it's government. Mm -hmm. Those are where all the tenants are sourced historically okay, well, what, in the outer boroughs, we, okay. other than a Court Street, which and is a more specialized thing market. Thing? That, that, those three areas are the three areas. And where those are the three where, areas that are counter-cyclical. I mean, for, Fordham and, uh, Road is, is a certain market. It's a, you know, uh, you know, it's a marketplace that's always done well for retail, and it does. But this need. is not retail. This is office. No, I yeah. know. Uh, yeah. 
I, I did a show two weeks ago with healthcare professionals. I had the head of Montefiore, they're the largest employer in the Bronx. Sure, uh, sure. Next to the city. Steve Fort Safford Fort was in University yeah, Steve right was across. Sure. Right. I went to high school with him, you know. You know. No, no. Steve? <laughs> yes. He's older than you. He's not older than I am. He's no. younger than you. <laughs> no. He's much younger than you. Oh, much younger? He has an age well. He's 14 <laughs> years younger than I am. <laughs> See what this business does to him? He was very bright. You know. You <laughs> are the same age? He skipped. No, I'm a year older. Oh, okay. Year no, he was on the show. Yeah. Uh, but Long Island City. You, I know you and your partner in crime. One of the, one of your guys, Mr. Kurloff, was on my show once, and he was talking about Long Island City. What do you think of Long Island City? We're doing a project with uh, Peter uh, together, you know, together We're joint um, venture, and we've done a few, a little bit of leasing there. Yes. Um, Where met, met yes, life, mm -hmm. exactly. And what's that going for these days? Twenty-five, you know, thirty. Uh, about thirty dollars a foot. Yes. Yeah. And, and we've just closed a deal recently, about uh, ten or 15,000, but you're not, not, not big users, small users. Um, and w what's happening is New York City is, because of the pricing and the subleases, is very competitive now, now, now to now the you out still, of Now you still have certain of the local retailers, which are not the, the greatest amenities on that side yeah, of the Yeah, but the MetLife space is a really a fantastic opportunity because yeah, the, the infrastructure and the installation there is really a... Now, the brass uh, people have a... The, a amen and the amenities uh, within right. the property itself right. is right. the attraction. That's exactly And right. it's basically moving condition. Right. And they also have the roof, and it, it yeah. works so, very well. So now I have a terrible question to ask. You know, we're in February... There's no more credit tenants. I mean, AIG used to be called the credit tenant. Citibank was called the credit tenant. You know, there was a company called Lehman Brothers. Mm. You know, look at Merrill Lynch and Bank of America. What's going to happen, heaven forbids, that if, if, like, if they do what they did in Europe, nationalizing some banks, what happens if, if Citigroup is taken over? What effect is that, or, or X-Bank? is taken over. What effect is that going to have on our office market in New York City? Well, I, I think we're seeing the effects of the big banks uh, already. Not only are they downsizing people, which is creating a small footprint, but these firms are really driving alternative work solutions, lowering the standard per square foot per person. I'm getting even worse, Peter. Well, I'm, saying, I'm saying they cut, they cut, or they go out of well, business. Well, first of all, if it's a yeah. bank is nationalized, that's a credit enhancement. You talk right. about downgrading no, credit, no, no, no. but but no. But if they're taken over but, first, then they put in, yeah. they put into a receivership where the land where the the government could disavow uh, the lease. Disavow the lease. Disavow the lease. Yeah. That's no, what I'm saying. Well, it's very, the what you're talking about is complicated, right? right? Uh, here's here's a, a uh, there's no question. It's not this is going to happen. There's not going to be a nationalized bank, not in the United States. Citigroup is not going to fail. Bank of America is not going to fail. There's not going to be another bank in this country that's that large that's going to fail. It's not going to happen. They're not going to allow it. So your question is very difficult to answer because it has a lot of complexity to it, right? Because if it, if it is uh, in receivership, all at leases can be disavowed, or, or at least you have the, the, the risk of that. So there's no question. It is a credit enhancement at some level because you know what? If we're out today, we're looking for government tenants. We're looking for federal tenants, state tenants. Municipal, uh, local municipals. What about Lower Manhattan, guys? I mean, we, we potentially have a loss of close to 11 mi million square feet. If you take Merrill moving out of the t to Bank of America, AIG getting rid of a lot of their space, Goldman, uh, Goldman, Goldman. moving into their tower, plus the, the loss of generally business. You know? Well, you know, the fir first thing, and I don't think it's talked about enough, we're going to have a paradigm change in Lower Manhattan when the memorial and the train station open. It'll make that area a 24-7 community, which it's never been, and it'll be, you know, a, a real change in, in the community. And it's going to have a number of interesting, you know, uh, affordable real estate opportunities that I think people are going to take Peter, advantage of. Peter, when is this? Well, you know, the that's the question. Thing, yeah, I think that's well, the question. I agree with Peter. Right. If you look at the I'm, translation, I'm not, right. um, look, I'm, look how 2012 is a, you know. Okay, let, let, me, let me respond to that. First of all, Peter's right to the extent that the local economy of downtown has been diversified. You have more retail, the streetscape is more animated. Uh, no question. It, it, it's more 24 7 today than it was. Uh, 10 or 15 years no ago. Question. So Especially the market fundamentals are substantially better for downtown on a macro right. economic basis. 
downtown is at risk in the short term because of the convulsion of the uh, uh, master tenancy down there, for lack of a better term. The intrinsic problem, downtown has always underperformed to midtown. I think Mitch said it earlier, location, location, location. Look at the commute patterns. If you live in Westchester and Fairfield County and you're commuting to New York and you come into Grand Central, uh, think about no that. Question. It's compelling. No, so it's commutation. No, a big uh, issue, too, is you're, we don't have companies that are hiring or looking to consolidate 10, 12,000 employees like Merrill was a couple of years ago. But companies who have that type of scale in this area, you know, Grand Central Station is still very important, but their demographics are the five boroughs and New Jersey, not the five boroughs and the northern suburbs. And that does give downtown an advantage, you know, in a hiring and in, in, in traffic. I mean, Peter, if I lived in Rumson, I'd work downtown, and you take that uh, ferry. Ferry. Yep. Uh, makes sense. Okay, I want to say one thing. One cents because we're nearly fit with. Yeah. I, I got the, the sign. Goodbye. Okay, no problem. But the industry, <laughs> the big question is, what is the industry that's going to backfill all of this space? That's a tough okay. question. And that is the biggest debate yet. that we all have. Right. What is the industry? Thirty minutes to have the four of you together is impossible. Yes. We're coming back in a couple, of, maybe in a couple of weeks, to put you back over here to talk about leasing. I'd like to thank Peter Rigardi, David Arena, Robert Friedman, and Mitch Kosker. See you next week. Thank you. Thank you. Major funding for these programs is provided by grants from Capital One Bank and Perfect Building Maintenance, Murray Hill Properties, SJP Properties, Cushman and Wakefield, Greenberg Traurig, LLP, New York Community Bank, Bank of America, Kilroy Metal Products, New York's Window Company. Additional funding is provided by Akron Gold Brothers, LLC, Briarwood Organization, C.B. Richard Ellis, City Investment Fund, Essex Capital Partners, Excel Realty Advisors, First American Title Insurance Company of New York, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, G.V.A. Williams, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Herrick Feinstein, LLP, Helmsley Spear, Jackson Development Group, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, James Orfanides, John Katsimatidis, Massey Knackle Realty Services, Madison Realty Capital, Marcus and Millichap, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Must Development, Palin Enterprises, Rosenthal and Rosenthal, Signature Bank, Sterling and Sterling, Stephen Napolitano, Stonehenge Partners, Studley, the Moynihan Group.